From vinyl records to speakeasy, synth pop, and even mom jeans, styles and trends from bygone eras are making a strong comeback. Could this phenomenon find its way into the clean energy industry? Maybe. As more of the world joins in on banning diesel and gasoline engines, there is one type of engine that might be poised for a comeback. The Stirling engine. More flexible, clean, and low maintenance than internal combustion engines, the Stirling engine might just factor into the future of clean energy. So what exactly is a Stirling engine? How does it work? And how is it different from the gas engines we know and tolerate? Could this relic of the past create a worthy niche for itself in our modern energy landscape? Or are some things just better left in the past? We thought these questions deserved a deeper dive here on Tuba Da Vinci. Special thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Feed your curiosity for math and science with the link in the description. In recent years, a number of pieces of technology have found their way back into the mainstream. In fact, if you're interested, we recently did a whole video on different types of mechanical batteries. What we know for certain is that there will likely never be a singular one-size-fits-all solution to energy production and storage. However, for some reason, the Stirling engine in particular has managed to climb its way out of the past and find a home in the modern age of energy, largely due to some of its very interesting characteristics. At its most basic level, a Stirling engine is a type of heat engine that utilizes the cyclical compression and expansion of air and other gases. The device, originally known as Stirling's air engine, was invented and patented all the way back in 1816 by Reverend Robert Stirling, who hoped to improve on some of the dangers and inefficiencies of the ubiquitous steam engines that exploded pun intended, during the Industrial Revolution. While other types of heat engines appeared in years prior to Stirling's invention, his was one of the earliest put into practical use in 1818 as a water pump inside a quarry. The engine consists of an airtight chamber filled with gas called the working fluid, as well as two pistons. Unlike internal combustion engines, which require the burning of fuel inside a combustion chamber, Stirling engines are external combustion engines, meaning that the driving energy comes from outside the closed system. And what is the driving energy? It can be any heat source, a solar mirror setup, coal fire, even something as simple as a cup of coffee. As the heat warms up on one side of the chamber, the working fluid expands. This working fluid can be any substance that remains in gas form as it heats and cools. Typically, working fluids include hydrogen or helium. In the interest of safety, helium or nitrogen is often used. It eliminates any risk of using oxygen and for good reason. The, the bottom is more hot than the up here. And it's making them, the wheel spin. As gases heat up and expand, they move upward. As the gas expands inside the engine's chamber, it pushes up against a piston, which it in turn attaches to a wheel. As the piston goes up, the wheel starts turning, transforming thermal energy into mechanical energy. While there are different models of Stirling engines, they all typically require two pistons. Unlike internal combustion engines, where the pistons are sealed to prevent gases from escaping, in a Stirling engine, there is no seal. Instead, air is freely allowed to move around the piston. This allows air to come into contact with both the hot and cool sides. Alpha models have a compression piston and an expansion piston placed inside two separate cylinders. While beta and gamma configurations have a work piston and a displacer piston, the former having both of them in the same cylinder and the latter separating them into hot and cold. Before we get back to the show, let me take a moment and tell you about our sponsor, Brilliant. If you watch my videos, odds are you're curious and like to figure out how stuff works. I studied engineering in college and then taught myself software and it completely changed my life, allowing me to save enough money to go full time here on YouTube. I love to learn. And if you've been even a little curious about getting into software, check out this course on pseudocode on Brilliant. If you've avoided software because it looks so complex, remember, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Software engineers start by writing pseudocode, a mix of words and numbers to help convey what we want to accomplish. This way, we don't get bogged down by the syntax or specifics of a programming language. Go through this class on Brilliant and you'll start to think like a software engineer. If you can write the steps to help a pet sitter feed your hamster, well, you just might be ready to start building your first app. 
I love the practical examples that they offer. And if you like problem solving, puzzles, math or science, support the show and be one of the first 200 users to use the link brilliant.com slash Vinci to save 20% on a yearly premium subscription with Brilliant. Once the heated gas reaches the top of the chamber, it meets what's known as the heat sink, usually a piece of metal that releases heat into the air. For high powered engines, this might be a radiator, which helps transfer heat at a much higher clip or it can simply be a top metal plate for the chamber itself. As the air cools, it contracts, sinking back down and pulling the piston, turning the wheel even more. Once the cold air sinks down to the hot side, the process begins all over again. One crucial point to remember is that what truly drives a Stirling engine is the heat exchange. So that begs the question, would a Stirling engine work with a cold fuel source? The answer is yes. If you were to take your engine off of your steaming hot coffee and place it on top of a refreshing iced coffee, you'd see the process start to work, but in reverse. In fact, by reversing the process, you can actually turn a Stirling engine into a heat pump. We'll get back to that in a little bit. So you might be thinking to yourself, great science lesson, but why are we talking about this 200 year old piece of technology? Well, it turns out some technologies are sort of like Betty White. They just keep coming back. As demand continues to increase for energy production and energy storage for intermittent renewables, the Stirling engine has emerged as a potential contender. It's important to understand the Stirling engine's strengths and weaknesses. Let's start with the strengths. Stirling engines are external combustion engines. This means all the soot and gunk buildup you have in internal combustion engines don't happen here. The result is far less maintenance and far longer operational lifetimes. Two, they have the potential to be far quieter in operation than either diesel or gasoline engines. Three, they are more efficient than either diesel or gasoline engines as well. A typical combustion engine might extract roughly 25% of the potential energy stored in the fuel. With the same fuel, some estimates suggest that a Stirling engine might be able to get between 40 and 50% of that potential energy. And four, they can also operate on really any fuel source that can provide heat. Now let's talk about the cons. One, to create a similar amount of work, a Stirling engine would typically have to be much larger than an internal combustion engine. Two, similarly, they have to also be heavier. Three, because they're bigger and less mass manufactured, they're gonna be significantly more expensive, at least at first. Four, Stirling engines like gas engines can't start by themselves and have significant thermal inertia to overcome in order to get started. Five, Stirling engines can't readily change its operating speed or RPM like a gas engine can. This is the final nail in the why can't we use Stirling engines in cars coffin. What's most attractive about Stirling engines is their ability to use a variety of heat sources as their driving power, meaning they don't need to be reliant on steam or fuel. I like to think of future applications for Stirling engines in places where there is currently waste heat rather than burning some fuel for the engine directly. For example, here's some common waste heat sources in your home. One, a refrigerator has a heat pump that sucks the heat inside itself and pumps it outside. This heat is currently just heating your home, which sounds nice in winter, but is anything but in the summertime. Two, a natural gas hot water heater isn't perfectly efficient and currently waste gases and heat is ported through exhaust vents in your roof or walls. Three, your air conditioning system is currently also a heat pump that moves perfectly good working heat and discards it outside. Four, your attic in the day gets heated up through heat transfer from the roof and through radiation from the roof materials. This heat is a huge source of heat eventually making its way into your home no matter how much insulation you install. And five, every laptop and smartphone and computer you have is all making heat. Cogeneration units sometimes called combined heat and power or CHPs utilize residual heat from coal, natural gas, or even nuclear power stations, which could not only make these power plants more efficient themselves, but could potentially make sizable impacts in carbon emissions. So you don't use any fuel directly, but instead harness any extra waste heat from these various power plant sources to further boost the plant's efficiency. Remember the waste heat is basically everywhere. Every light bulb, TV, computer, car, basically everything makes waste heat. If you're thinking about other areas in your life where there is a temperature gradient as a potential application for a Stirling engine, remember that what you want is waste heat. For example, if you hooked up one side of your Stirling engine to the nice cool air conditioned home and the other side to the outside hot air, sure you could power a Stirling engine. 
But remember that what you'd be moving is heat from outside into inside. And that's not what you want because then you'll just have to run the air conditioning to cool your house down again. Let's go back to an example I mentioned earlier, the hot attic. Now as a free bonus to all my viewers, I'm gonna let you future inventors in on a billion dollar idea. All I ask in return is a simple click of that like button. Okay, so your attic is probably the hottest part of your home and that heat slowly heats up the rest of your house. But what if instead we installed a huge radiator with big fins able to absorb this heat? We could then pump a working fluid like water through it, much like a radiator in a car or a water cooled PC. This water would get hot through the radiator and then we could pump it through a hot plate on a Stirling engine. The engine, once started, would begin to reciprocate and we would generate electricity. The cool side of the plate will then just pump the air outside. So if your attic was 120 degrees and the outside air was 80 degrees, this 40 degree delta that was just making your house hotter could now be used to generate electricity. An important thing to remember here is that if you want to really make some serious amount of energy, you need to transfer a serious amount of heat. That's why our coffee cup Stirling engine will never make much energy. It's just a flat plate and only has a small amount of surface area for heat transfer. Larger, more complex heat sinks with materials like copper make the entire system more expensive and complex, but far more effective. Stirling engines could also help with intermittency in renewables. When placed at a focal point of a parabolic solar mirror, a Stirling engine can convert solar energy into electricity at an efficiency rate comparable to concentrated photovoltaic panels. But even better, they could store all that energy in something like a flywheel during peak production hours, then quickly and efficiently disperse that energy during primary consumption hours. Stirling engines have already been used in a number of applications. The Swedish Navy has three submarines equipped with Stirling-based propulsion systems, according to their shipbuilding firm Kokum, are the quietest vessels in their class. As we mentioned earlier, one other promising application of Stirling technology is in heat pumps. By applying mechanical power, you can actually reverse the engine's process, turning it into a heat pump, where heat is absorbed during the expansion process at ambient temperatures and expelled during the compression process, where it can then be carried off to perform a useful heating function in a given space. A useful analogy is an electric motor. Provide electricity as input and it can spin a car's wheels, but then flip things around, use the spinning wheels kinetic energy as input to turn the electric motor and you can create electricity to store in a battery. In the same way, if you use heat potential, you can power a Stirling engine's piston. Or inversely, if you provide mechanical power to move the piston, then you can pump heat potential from one side of the engine to the other. Considering that today over 3 billion heating appliances are used all over the world, most of them requiring a lot of energy as well as hydrofluorocarbon refrigerants, a Stirling powered heat pump system would provide a far more efficient, cleaner alternative without all the harmful fuels and emissions. NASA used Stirling powered cooling systems during the shuttle program years, and British company Fluid Mechanics is developing a system for commercial use utilizing helium, which can transfer energy 10 times more efficiently than air. As always, there are some valid reasons why we don't see this technology applied all across the board. The main issue is size and weight. For Stirling engines to produce noteworthy amounts of energy, they need to be pretty big, which means higher cost. This Stirling engine, for example, for all the sound and glory, can only power this tiny LED. And that's because, well, it's really small. So the amount of heat energy it's able to absorb on one side and release on the other side is also very small. This gets to the heart of why we don't see Stirling engines more often. Like everything, it comes down to the added cost and complexity and if it's worth it. Historically, for water heaters and HVAC manufacturers, the answer has been no. Garages are already crowded and it's hard to imagine making extra space for a Stirling engine. Also, another problem we have today is that all of our appliances work on islands. Refrigerators, ACs, and water heaters don't work together or talk to each other. But what if, just like water or electricity, a heat line ran through your house and into your attic. Then large appliances that produce heat could dump their heat into this heat line. Then this heat line plus extra heat from the attic could be used to power a whole house Stirling engine. Tesla has mentioned that they want to get into the HVAC system game. And I have a feeling they'll be thinking about the detached appliances in your home in a more holistic way. As homes get smarter and regulations require us to get more efficient, I think the concept of a heat line coupled with a Stirling engine is a very real possibility in the next decade. But as we mentioned, there are some key challenges we have to overcome. So if you're an engineer, scientist, 
or a curious nerd like me, why not start thinking about the problem yourself? You never know where it might lead you. But what do you think? Are Sterling engines the way to go for renewables and other applications? Or should we place our focus on other emerging energy tech? Let us know in the comments section. Thank you guys so much for watching. This was a really fun video to make. I love Sterling engines. They are really awesome. And if you want to get your hands on one, check out Amazon. They have them for like 20 or 30 bucks. Endless hours of fun to be had. And as always, a huge thank you to all of our 2-Bit Tribe members. That is our patrons on Patreon and our YouTube channel members. You guys help us write our scripts, do reviews, we do video calls, and it's just a fun place for people who love the future and technology to chat and hang out amongst ourselves. So if you want to join us, well, links in the description, we'd love to have you on board. Take a look around. We have some other awesome videos on some really fun and interesting technology that we think you will like. And until next time, I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci, and if nothing else, just remember the future is going to be awesome.